Good morning. Welcome to the post JavaScript apocalypse. So this morning I'm going to be talking about JavaScript, obviously, and programming and how we can program better and the things that I anticipate happening in the next language, whatever happens after JavaScript. But there's some controversy about the title of this talk. There are some experts who think it should be called the put JavaScript apocalypse and others who think it should be called the patch JavaScript apocalypse. And this controversy, the put post patch controversy is due to HTML. HTML is the hypertext transport protocol and it provides commands for retrieving documents, which is mostly what the web does, which uses get. And it also provides three commands for sending stuff back to servers. In fact, everything sends stuff back to servers, but servers are supposed to remember it in this case. And each of these work slightly differently. And some are indicated for some cases and not for others, but most of the time they work exactly the same. And so this creates enormous amount of controversy. Which one are you supposed to do? And there are some experts who very strongly believe in certain circumstances, you must use one and not another or terrible, terrible things will happen. And it's not clear that terrible things will happen, but what is terrible is that we waste an enormous of time, amount of time talking about which one of these three synonyms which we should use in any situation. Had it been designed properly, there'd be just one and there wouldn't be any argument. But by creating choice, unnecessary choice, it creates controversy which just wastes time and creates confusion. And I hate confusion. So the fact that we have three things where there should be one is a symptom of clutter. And in our programming systems, we experience lots and lots of sources of clutter, and these make our lives harder, but we love the clutter. But we could be much more effective if we could get rid of it. The world's greatest living authority on getting rid of clutter is Marie Kondo, or uh, Komari. She has a international practice in which she teaches people how to remove clutter from their homes. And she's brilliant at organizing things. So she teaches how to arrange things and how to sort things and how to fold things, how to get everything so that you can have the most utility and most beauty in the stuff that you own. But she also teaches how to get rid of stuff. So we spend our lives attaining stuff. And you know, there's the saying, whoever dies with most toys wins. And so we're all in this competition to accumulate stuff. But stuff has value and it has cost. And usually when we think of the cost, we think of the cost of acquisition or maybe the cost of replacement, but there are other costs. There's the cost of storage and the cost of presentation. And some people have to buy or rent much bigger places or places outside of their home in order to store all of their stuff. And there are certain ways that you can store things from which you get no value because you can't see it, you can't find it. And so stuff that you own that you can't access really has no value. And the way that you store things can cause the stuff to degrade because there's other stuff on top of it, which is slowly destroying it. So she teaches, get rid of the stuff that you don't need. And the way she does that is she'll take everything in a room and remove it from the shelves and closets and drawers and put everything in the middle of the floor. And then you pick up each one individually and then you apply this to it. Uh, 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 toki meku, which means throb or vibrate in Japanese. Um, so you pick it up and if it, you know, if it says something to you, if it communicates to you, if it has value to you, then you keep it. And if it doesn't, then you put it on eBay or you give it to charity or you recycle it or gift it to someone or, or toss it, that it's not producing enough value for you to keep. And so you should take it someplace else. When she teaches in America, she doesn't say throb or vibrate because that causes some people to giggle, you know, like, like that guy. So um, she says spark joy, which is really delightful. So you pick up the thing, does it spark joy? Is there some intuitive emotional connection to the thing which tells you, yes, this has value, this is something I keep as opposed to other things. 
So I would like to do a similar kind of discipline to our programming tools and our systems and, and the stuff that we make. Unfortunately, spark joy is not a good criteria for programmers because we love the clutter. And so every bit of clutter sparks joy. You know, when ES6 was coming out, I, I read a lot of people writing, I can't wait for ES6 to come out so I can use every feature. You know, they, weren't, they didn't even know what the features were yet, but they were already sparking joy. And many of those features, in fact, are not good um, and probably are things that should not have happened and having happened are things you shouldn't use, but programmers love that stuff. So getting rid of clutter in programming is much harder because our emotional attachment to this stuff is really strong and deep, so deep that we, it's difficult for us to get rid of things. And so the intuitive emotional thing doesn't work. Instead, we have to do the hard-headed uh, rational thing, which is what we imagine we do all the time, but in fact, we do it very rarely. So I'm going to give you some examples of, of how this works. So we're going to start with the ASCII set, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This is, or was for a long time the standard character set for computer systems in the US and eventually the world. It is still the first 128 characters in the Unicode set. Very, very important collection of characters. It was designed for teletype machines. It was designed by the uh, telegraph industry that they wanted to replace instruments that had a single key with instruments that had dozens of keys attached to a printer so that they could significantly reduce the cost of sending messages from one station to another. And then someone realized, wow, we could just take one of those teletype machines and connect it to a computer instead of to a, another teletype machine. And that gives us a nice alternative for punch cards, which is how things happen. Now, uh, two of the characters that you find in Unicode are tab and space. Space obviously advances the space, you know, one space in, in the document. Tab was taken from typewriters. Old mechanical typewriters had a tab or tabulate key, which when you pressed it would release the carriage so it could swing freely to one side until it was obstructed by a mechanical tab stop. And the tab stops were adjusted by um, taking these little metal plugs that were held in place with screws and you would put it to the place where you wanted the thing to stop so that you could make it easy to do indentations or, or type numbers and columns or applications like that. And they included tab in this set even though the teletype machines didn't use it. So just you know, thinking forward, actually thinking backward, thinking backward to mechanical typewriters, they put this character in anticipating this might be useful someday. But they didn't define how to establish a tab stop. They didn't determine what the default tab spacings were. They left that unspecified. And so today we are still arguing about it. So we don't at various times, there have been standards of 10 spaces, eight spaces, five spaces, four, two. There's no international standard for what a tab stop should be by default. And so it's something we're, we're constantly arguing about. So um, has anyone seen Silicon Valley? This is a great show, it's on HBO. If you haven't seen it, buy a subscription to HBO. Don't steal it. HBO deserves to be compensated for putting on the best show ever made about programming. Okay. So it's about a, a brilliant programmer named Richard uh, Hendricks and his adventures with his friends trying to start up a software company here. And he's a brilliant guy, but he's lonely. He can't get a girlfriend, but you know, he's a good guy. In the third season, he finally finds someone. He finds her, she's a programmer, she's very smart, she's nice, she likes him, yeah, you know, she's perfect for him, except that she uses spaces instead of tabs. <laughs> and Richard just can't deal with that, because it turns out his emotional attachment to an, an invisible control character is much stronger than any potential relationship he could have with a human being. So he just explodes it and, and off she goes. So 
so we, we get this tab versus spaces thing. And it turns out there's not a good argument saying one should always be better than the other. Um, there used to be a good argument in favor of tabs. Um, back when we measured storage in kilobytes, the fact that you could compress a file by replacing some of the spaces with tabs was a significant advantage. We now measure storage in terabytes. And that just that argument has vanished to nothing. So that doesn't make any sense. So, but the fact that we have two and that people are allowed to choose either and that they then form emotional attachments to them and that there are problems of integration of stuff that's written one way versus the other, it is a source of problems and bickering. You know, we, we've, you know, we're at the deadline, we need to release this. Well, wait a minute, I have to write an essay about why tabs are better. You know, that, that stuff is going on constantly. So if I had a time machine, I would go back to when the ASCII set was being invented. And I would go back to the inventor of ASCII and say, Bob, I'm from the future. I'm here to tell you, don't put tab in the ASCII set because it's just going to cause problems and you can't imagine how awful it's going to be. Don't do it. But I, I can't go back in time, but I have some control over my present. So I recommend now we just get rid of tab because it's just not worth it. It's just not worth all of the arguing. It's not worth trying to decide which side is better because neither side is significantly better. But the fact that the argument goes on costs us much more than any value that this character could ever deliver to us. It's just not worth it. This is clutter. Let's get rid of clutter. And then we don't have to argue. And then things are easy and, and on we go. Another thing that we got from ASCII was lowercase. So before ASCII, there was an earlier code called uh, Bado, which was a five-bit code. But it could, it could do letters and numbers and special characters. How, how do you do that in five bits, which can only deliver at most 32 characters? The way they did that was they had a shift code. So you'd send shift, and then all the letters turn into digits and special characters. And then you send another code to turn the shift off, and you'd get back to letters. So when they were designing ASCII, they wanted to do better than that. Or they, you know, the reason to do another thing is because you want to make a better thing. And so they decided to make a six-bit character set. So they wanted to have letters and digits and special characters and also lowercase. And the way they would get lowercase is you would send a shift character. So normally it'd be lowercase and you send a shift character and then it'll be uppercase. Had it worked out that way, the way we think about case today would be extremely different. Today, uppercase A and lowercase A have very distinct codes. They are different. But in the original model for ASCII, they would be the same. So we would represent the difference between uppercase and lowercase in exactly the same way that we communicate weight and decoration and slant and typeface and color and all the other things. It's just, you know, there's so many different ways that you can display an A. Right? And one of the characteristics about it is, is that. They decided not to do that, the committee that was creating ASCII. And the reason they didn't was they were concerned that if they sent a shift character, and if the shift character got garbled in transmission, then the rest of the document, when it printed out, would look stupid. And they were really concerned about that. At that time, teletype lines were very noisy. Today, things are very different. We've got uh, much higher quality optical networks, and we've got uh, error correcting codes, which are so amazingly effective that we have no awareness of them anymore. But they hadn't reached that point in ASCII yet. They weren't doing computing yet. So they made the choice to extend the character set to seven bits and give each of the lowercase characters a separate code. And as a consequence of that, when we start using that for computing, it creates case sensitivity. Had they not done that, everything would be case insensitive. But today we've got two ways of comparing two texts. And one of them is faster and the other is correct. But because we have these two and there's no way of agreeing on them, we have created all sorts of problems for ourselves. Unfortunately, there's no way to go back and fix that one. So we're stuck with that. So lowercase is always, from now on, going to have a separate set of codes. Another thing we got from ASCII was 
two quoting characters, a single quote and a double quote. And JavaScript has both of these quoting characters in it. Both make string literals. Both work exactly the same. So there's no advantage to using one or the other. And so there are arguments about which one you use. Do you use just single space or just double space? Or do you use both in some mixture? And I've been on all sides of this one. And for a while, I, was, I, I had an argument where certain kinds of strings should be in lowercase and other kinds of strings should be in uppercase, depending on its role within the program. But there was no straightforward way of enforcing that or determining that it was being done correctly. And other people had different strategies for how to use these two characters, which were also reasonable but incompatible. So that's causing problems. So you got two things. Just having two things is a source of trouble. We only need one. Provably, we only need one. So we should get rid of one of them. So I think the one we should get rid of is the single quote because it's overloaded with apostrophe. So if we don't use it as a quoting character anymore, then that ambiguity goes away. And so we eliminate another source of errors. ES6 or, or uh, ECMAScript 2015 introduced two new statements to the language, two new declarations, or uh, let and const. So we have let and var, which both declare variables and are, are very similar, but work slightly differently in ways which can be very important. So um, again, there are different strategies. There's some people saying, in some cases, you should use one, and some you should use the other. And that creates clutter. And I, I'm trying to get rid of clutter. So I recommend that we get rid of one of them. And the one I would get rid of is var, because let has the advantage that when Java programmers read the program, they don't get as confused. And that turns out to be a really good thing. So get rid of let unless you have to support programs on Internet Explorer. And if you're using Inter Internet Explorer, you have to use var, <clears throat> and you can't use let. Now, my, my feeling on that is nobody should ever again have to do anything on Internet Explorer. We, we should be done with that by now. I mean, we're, we're well into the 21st century that there's no excuse for that. So the other thing we get now is the const thing. Const is the same as let, except that you cannot assign to that variable anymore. You can only do it once. And so when you have a choice, if either of these work, I, I recommend use const instead of let, because it, it's a little bit stronger and a little bit more functional. We'll get to why it's more functional in, in a few minutes. Now, the problem with let is that there are programmers who are confused about the difference between, or the problem with const is that there are people who are confused about the difference between const and freeze. They're completely orthogonal, um, but it's really important that you understand the difference. So in my opinion, you should not be able to get a JavaScript license unless you understand the difference between const and freeze. So if you don't get it, you know, go home tonight and, and study it, because this is really important, because I don't think you should be able to get paid for programming without a JavaScript license. So yeah, use const wherever you can. JavaScript provides two bottom values, null and undefined, which was a mistake. You shouldn't have two of these things. There's a very good argument that you shouldn't have either of these things. But if you're going to have one, you should only have one. And so I want to throw one of them away. And the one I'm going to throw away is null, which is unfortunate because it's the more universal name. It's the correct name. Undefined is a really confusing name because it's a value which that you can have a variable which is you can define a variable and its value is undefined so it's defined and undefined at the same time it's crazy but i prefer undefined in javascript because it's the one that the language itself uses so if we're going to only, and null has other things broken about it for example type of null returns object which is completely wrong so if we get rid of null, then that problem goes away. But ideally, in a, in a better language, we would keep the name null, and we would not have anything ever that was called undefined. So the null pointer, as a feature of a programming language, was invented by Tony Hoare, who's a brilliant British programmer. 
and did a lot of work with Algol. He's best known for having invented quicksort, which is an amazing recursive sorting algorithm. And it was his idea to have null pointers as something that we do in languages. And he now calls that a billion dollar mistake. And the, the problem with null is that if you have a reference to something, and if there is a possibility that, can, that it can be null, which in languages like Java is always possible, then before you touch it, you need to ask, are you not null? And that's a burden that most programmers try to avoid. And so programs fail quite frequently. Depending on the design of the program, it can fail slightly badly or horribly badly. Like in C++, null maps to zero, which is an address in memory, which depending on how memory is mapped on that system could be really critical memory. And so you can cause fires and bad things to happen. In Java, it's less bad. It'll throw an exception instead, which is not bad. But sometimes it seems like Java was optimized for generating null pointer exceptions. That they seem to happen a lot. So if we're to design a new language, how should null work? And I think in an improved version of JavaScript, which can't happen because JavaScript can't be improved because it's on the web and that's how the web works. But if it, you know, a thought experiment, if we could go back and make JavaScript correct, how would we do that? I think we would make null an immutable empty object. So you could retrieve things from that thing. So the definition could look like that. We'd make a, a global constant called null and it would contain an empty object which inherited nothing, which is frozen. So that means you cannot assign to it. If you try to assign to it, it'll throw an exception, which is what it should do. But if you try to read from it, no matter what you try to read, it will return null. So that means you could say, uh, give it a path name, like object.foo.bar.blah, blah, 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 blah. And if that path resolves to a value, you get that value. And the path, if the path doesn't resolve to a value, you get undefined, which is, or I'm sorry, you get null in, in this improved language, which is great. That's just what it should do. So all those null pointer kinds of problems go away. There's a lot of talk these days about pure functional programming. Pure functional programming is a really important idea. It has lots of advantages. It's been around for a few decades, and it's just now starting to move into the mainstream. So this is something you need to be aware of because you're probably going to spend the next decade doing more and more pure functional programming. So pure functions in a programming language are analogous to mathematical functions. In mathematics, a function is a, a description of a mapping between input values and output values. They're not really about computation. When you create a mathematical function it defines all of the possible inputs and all the possible outputs. And so when we think about computation, what we're really doing is discovering what the mappings are. So in, in this pure idea, when you give a specific input to a function, you will always get exactly the same output. That, that's part of the, the mathematical discipline of these things. But it also means that that's all that a function can do is perform that mapping. It cannot cause any mutation, can't change any global variables, can't modify any data structures, and it can have no side effects. The only thing it will do is compute. So why would you want to limit yourself in this way? Well, it turns out there are some really important advantages. The first is testability. Because a function does not depend on any other state or condition, they are really easy to test. If you give it an input and you get the right output, you're done. You've done it. And you never have to test it again because it's, that's all it is. So you don't need any mocks. You don't need any stubs. You just in and out, good. So if, if you like doing test-driven development, you should love pure functions because they're really easy to test. You get composability. So there's a thing called higher order functions where you have functions that take functions as arguments and return functions as results. And that gives you a really powerful way of composing functions together to do amazingly powerful things. And because they have each of these functions has no state of its own, they, there are no weird interactions between them. 
like you would get, say, with inheritance. With inheritance, you get very tight coupling from one class to another. In this functional composition model, you don't get that coupling. And so your programs are much more resilient, much, more, much less likely to cause errors as a result of being coupled. So that's really good. And the best thing of all is parallelism. Because you can run all of these pure things at once, and nothing can go wrong. So when we try to make computer systems go faster, we'll use threads. And fortunately, threads fail badly if you have two functions that are trying to read, modify, write the same piece of memory at the same time. That's called a race, and it, it's awful. So you want to avoid that, and we do that with mutual, mutual exclusion, you know, with locks and synchronization. But unfortunately, that slows down the computation and can cause deadlocks. But if you're going fully parallel with um, pure functions, pure functions never read, modify, write. You know, they're just computing and going forward. And so those thread interactions don't happen. So you can have everything running simultaneously, and it's all good. So I anticipate in some future version of JavaScript, you're going to be able to send a pure function to array.map. And array.map will be able to start on all the available threads and, and uh, cores, all of the elements of the array at once. Everything runs, and it all goes to the end. So when that happens, JavaScript becomes the world's fastest programming language, which would be really, really cool. That we can finally do parallel processing in a straightforward way. So, what do we need to add to JavaScript to get pure functional programming? Turns out we don't need to add anything. It's, it's got everything in there. We just need to remove the impurities. So what do we have to remove? So first, we need to remove the global date function. Because every time you call date, you get a different answer, because the clock doesn't stop ticking. So that's not mathematically pure, right? Because we, when you call a function, you should always get the same result. Math.random, we also have to remove for the same reason, that we can't have a function that does not always return the same thing. We need to remove the delete operator and things like object.assign, because they can modify an object, and we're not allowed to modify anything anymore. We get rid of array.splice and all of the other methods of array, which can modify an array, because we're not allowed to change them. We can only make new things. Um, we also need to get rid of array.sort, because it sorts a, an array in place. Had, a, had sort been defined to create a new array, which is sorted, then we could keep it. But unfortunately, that's not how it was specified, so we have to throw away array.sort. Uh, we can't have uh, the exact function of regular expressions, because it modifies the regular expression object. So that has to go away. We have to get rid of assignment. You can't, have, you can't use the equal sign anymore to assign a new value to a variable or to a data structure. So that means we need to get rid of the var statement. We need to get rid of the, const, or the let statement. But we can keep the const statement. Computation with const statements is OK. So if you want a function which can compute some intermediate results, const is great. You can continue to do that. We have to get rid of the for statement and the other loops, because a loop wants to be changing things in its body, especially for which wants to be changing an induction variable. We can't have that. So you need to use array.for each or other sorts of things instead, or even better, be using recursive functions. Re recursion is great for pure functional programming. Got to get rid of the users. So because every time you ask a user for something, they're liable to tell you something else. So users are not mathematically pure, so they have to go. <laughs> and we have to get rid of the network. In fact, we can't do any I.O. at all, because anytime you, you go outside of your computational bubble, there is a chance that you might get something which can do something different than it did last time. And so we have to get rid of that. So that all sounds kind of hard, right? You know, what, what can you accomplish using these restrictions? Well, it turns out you can accomplish quite a lot. That um, you know, while the universe is constantly mutating, if you're writing programs that interact with the universe, which is mostly what we're doing, it can be hard in a pure computational model. But we can have a hybrid model. 
um, where we try to have pure functions wherever we can, whenever we're thinking about how we project things or modify things or generate new values of things, we can try to do that purely. And then at the very end, when we have to persist to that result, then we'll go back to the old messy world where we can actually modify stuff. You know, things like a customer balance cannot be a pure mathematical result, right? Because those are always changing. But the rules by which we decide what the next balance is going to be, that can be pure. And so the more of our systems that we can transfer to the pure side, then the easier it'll be to compose them and test them and perhaps even accelerate them. So one of the features, new features in ES6 is generators. This is a feature that was inspired by uh, Python, which is a, a mutated form of, uh, of coroutines. I think it was a mistake. I think we shouldn't have put it in the language. It introduces some strange new syntax where there's now an asterisk and a function name and uh, a new operator yield, which acts very strangely because it will stop in the middle of a statement and resume later. Anything which makes control flow more complicated, I think, is ultimately a bad idea. Now, in, in the structured programming thing, we learned a lot about how problematic complicated control flow could be. And I think this is adding unnecessary complexity back into the language. But the idea behind a generator where a generator will yield a function where every time you call it, you get another value. It's not pure, but it's a really powerful idea. And I think that's valuable. And it turns out you don't need all of this new syntax in JavaScript in order to accomplish that. So this is how I recommend making generators in JavaScript for people who need generators. It's just a function that returns a function. So the outer function is something that you can call a factory. It's a function that makes generators. And it can take parameters. You can describe what the generator is going to generate. And then the factory will have its private state variables, where, which will get mutated each time you generate a value. And it will return a generator function, which will compute a new value and update the state variables and return the new value. So it's a really simple thing. If you can manage one function inside of another, you've got all the tools you need to make a generator. So here's an example. This is the element generator. It will take an array as its argument, and it will return a generator, which will return each of the elements of the array. Each time you call the generator, you'll get the next element. And when it's done, it'll return undefined. And so that is the sentinel that you have reached the end of a generated sequence. This is really straightforward don't need loops, which, which I like a lot. Um, so if you can master this little bit of code, you can write generators. It's really a simple concept, but really powerful because these things can compose in the same way that pure functions can. So you can concatenate sequences, you can filter sequences, you can have sequences start other things. It's incredibly powerful. So something we've had in JavaScript from the beginning is callbacks. Uh, but uh, you know, callbacks are, are the primitive on which we build up systems that can do asynchronous programming and asynchronicity is really important and is becoming more important all the time. But we have a choice of ways that we can write a function that takes a callback. And because there's a choice, there's an argument. And so there are two ways that you could write such a, a function that takes a callback. You can make the callback the first argument or you can make the callback the last argument. And it doesn't matter to the function. The function works fine either way. It matters to the community because some people will write them one way and some people will write them other and then we'll want these things to work with each other. And that becomes really problematic if we have these different conventions. And so we have these different conventions and some people feel very strongly that it should work one way or the other, often, usually, almost always without any evidence it's just the way they're used to doing it. And so they must have been doing it right because why would they have done it wrong? Someone else must have done it wrong. And, and I hate these sorts of arguments because again, they waste a lot of time. They create bugs and confusion. Far in excess of the value that we get being able to write them one way or the other. 
So I would recommend that we solve this just by picking one. And from now on, that's the one that we all do. It's similar to the idea of having courts. Sometimes if you go to court, it's entirely possible that the court will reach the wrong decision. And courts do that all the time. But we just tolerate that. The reason we tolerate that is even going to court and getting a decision against you, which you think is unfair and wrong, it's better than the alternative, which is drawing swords and, and, and fighting the other party to death. So we don't do that. So that's good. So we decided even if it goes against us, that's better than doing it the old school way. Although in this case, it's not completely arbitrary. I think one is definitely better than the other. And that is doing it first. And the reason is because in ES6, we added the ellipsis operator so that we can have functions that take a variable number of arguments. And that operator only works in the final position, which means if you're going to have a callback, the callback should be in the first position. ES6 added promises, which um, I, I think was a mistake. Promises were invented at a company that I founded called Electric Communities. And promises were developed in order to support secure distributed protocols with uh, some amazing properties. Those promises uh, transited to some other languages and eventually found its way into JavaScript where it mutated kind of weirdly and it lost a lot of the really important stuff that it had. And it's now being used primarily for management of asynchronicity, which is not what it was designed for. It did deal with asynchronicity because it was designed for distributed systems, but it wasn't designed specifically to do the things that we need it to do. And so it's messy and, and weird. It's definitely vastly superior to doing nested callbacks, which is what people were doing prior to promises. But I think there are better ways of managing asynchronicity. Um, another, a, a similar concern I have about other features that are being proposed for JavaScript and other languages is an attempt to try to make asynchronous programs look exactly like synchronous programs. On the theory that asynchronicity is hard to think about and sequential stuff is easier to think about. But I don't like that because it means that the people who are going to be programming those systems will never understand truly how asynchronicity works. And it turns out the universe is asynchronous. And understanding how the universe works is going to be really important in understanding how distributed programming works because that's the future of our craft. So anything which is trying to hide from us reality, I think is ultimately going to be counterproductive. I think we really need to understand that stuff. So we should be using tools which help us to manage asynchronicity better. Um, um, and I don't think it's promises. In fact, I think it's something called RQ. RQ is a, a library that I developed. It's available for free on GitHub. It, it uses requester functions, which is a function which takes a callback, which will do stuff, which are composable. And it, RQ provides a small library of composition tools to let you do things in sequences, to let you do things in parallel, all fully asynchronous uh, in a really straightforward way. So this is the try statement. Uh, try originated in a, in a different form in a language called Clue. And eventually found its way into the mainstream. This is what try looks like in Java. And there's some interesting things to observe about this. So in the try block, we have some code which might fail for some reason. And the motivation for having try and catch and all this other stuff is that there are some things which can go wrong, which are really unlikely. And we don't want to clutter our code with that code to handle those very unlikely events all the time. So we can hide that code someplace else. And that was a good idea. But unfortunately, it interacts badly in JavaScript or in Java because of problems with its type system. So down at the bottom, we've got this finally clause. And what that is, is an implied function. Uh, that thing looks like a block, but it's actually a function body. And it can be called invisibly in the try if the try 
exits for any reason, if it breaks or if it throws or if it returns, before it does, it will call that function, call the finally function and do that. And the same thing happens in each of those catch, catch clauses. So the code is actually really complicated because not only is there everything that's written, but there are all these implied function calls that are also hidden in the code. An implied function call is a very powerful, very subtle thing. And I, I hate things that are powerful and subtle because errors hide in those places. I want things to be simple and clean and straightforward, and, and that is not what's happening here. The reason fi finally was added to Java was because it did not have functions. And so there was no way of having a single thing containing the cleanup code that you needed that could be accessed in all of these different pathways. And so they, and in fact, if you look at how the virtual machine is implemented, it actually has functions in it, which are only used by the finally thing, or at least until recently. Um, so if they'd had functions then that finally would not have been necessary. But then the other thing you have is all of these catches. You know, why are there so many catch blocks? This is because of another problem with Java's type system, that a method can only return something of a specific type. But it's very common that there is more than one possible conclusion of something. There is the normal case, but there is the other normal case, um, which isn't the unlikely failure that exceptions were originally created for. It's it's a way of escaping from the type system so that you can have multiple types of return statements. Each of the throws is a different kind of return. So instead of that happening, maybe that happens or that happens. So things which may be normal results for the, the processing of this method, but which need to be communicated out of band because we can't return it as an ordinary value. So as a result, we've got all of this stuff which is hidden in the exception system, which really is illustrating errors in the type system. So you contrast this to the way that we write exception handlers in JavaScript. And in JavaScript, we don't need finally because we have uh, functions and we don't need all, we, we can't have all those catches because we don't have different exception types. And we also have functions that can return any kind of value, any kind of object, whatever you need, you can return that. So you don't need to overload throw in order to indicate things which are exceptional or, or, or not uh, the always case. And so in well-written JavaScript, what you see is we'll try something that might fail. And if it works, then we're done. And if it doesn't work, we'll go to plan B, whatever that is. We don't even have to ask what went wrong because all we know is, all we need to know is something went wrong. So, you know, deal with that. And then we can clean up. So we don't even need to have a separate function for handling the cleanup. So in JavaScript, because the type system is not working against us, we can have programs which are much simpler and cleaner. So one of the biggest places where we have clutter in our language is in the syntax. Syntax is where most of the problems in programming languages lie. And it's because we love the syntax. We form deep emotional connections to the syntax, but the syntax in most of our languages is working against us. So much so that in some languages, like in Lisp, they decided to have no syntax at all. That um, they determined that the complexity of the syntax was working against their interest of having uh, better programs. So let's look at the if statement through the ages. So the first if statement there is from Fortran 4, which comes from the late 60s. Uh, we're still in uh, all uppercase because Fortran was written in punch cards. And the parents between the if and the a are required because in Fortran, spaces are not significant. So if you said if space a, Fortran sees that as IFA. So in order to, to make it easier for the compiler to sort that out, they require the parentheses around the condition. And then you see it's using uh, the equal sign for assignment, which was a terrible mistake, but you know, Fortran did that to us. And they used dot EQ dot to represent the equality operator. 
Then moving forward, I think about 10 or so years, we've got BCPL. BCPL was the first good parts language. BCPL started with a very complex language called CPL. It took, there are a number of languages which attended to be the all-inclusive, can do everything that needs to be done languages. And most of those ended badly, including CPL. BCPL said, let's just take the good parts of that. And so this is their if statement. And I think they got it right. So BCPL was the first curly brace language. And in BCPL, the parents around the condition are now optional. You can leave those out if you don't need them. And the curly braces around the consequence are required, which was exactly the right thing. So hooray for BCPL. So BCPL was an influential language. For example, BCPL introduced the idea of bytecode interpreters as a way of distributing software, an idea that was copied by the Pascal P machine and the Java virtual machine. So those ideas come from BCPL. BCPL was also a big influence on a language called B, which was the inspiration for C and C++ and Java and JavaScript. So we look at JavaScript and its influence from, from the B language, and we see it's regressed a bit. So we now have lowercase, which is moving forward, because when BC, BCPL was developed, we were using uh, teletypes with half ASCII, but the expensive teletypes with full ASCII hadn't been made cheap yet, and so it's all uppercase. But now we're all lowercase. And um, the parentheses are back. The Fortran parentheses are back. And the uh, curly braces on the consequence are now optional, which is a huge source of error. And you, know, you, know, you hear from guys all the time saying, yeah, I'm leaving the curly braces out. And it's so free. And, yeah, but, but it's much more likely that this code is going to go bad for them or for someone else. So I highly recommend, even though it's not required by the language, put the damn curly braces in the program because it makes it much more likely that another human will come along and make this program better without you causing them to make errors, which is inexcusable. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for, for that spon spon spontaneous ovation. It's much appreciated. So looking at a, uh, a language that didn't become influential, Algol 68, this was intended to be the uh, successor to Algol 60, which was a brilliant language. Algol 60 was an extremely successful design by committee, maybe the only successful design of a programming language by committee. Algol 68 tried to do the same thing, didn't pull it off. The language turned out to be much too complicated and weird. But I really liked their if statement. I thought their if statement looked pretty nice. That um, they're doing the correct thing now with um, equality. So they use the equal sign to indicate that something is equal to something, which is, I think, what equal sign should be used for. And they used Algol's assignment, character, assignment symbol for doing assignment, which I think is good. And I really like the thing of having phi as the bound of the if. That just looks really, really clean to me. So we get rid of the curly braces, get rid of the blocks. It's just nice. Um, but I think we could simplify that even further. That one of the things in Fortran, which in retrospect I think was a good idea, was they had one statement per card. So when you reach the end of a card, that was the end of the statement. Um, C and I think even BCPL tried to change that, um, I think due to Algol's influence, that you could have multiple statements on a line, you could have a statement span multiple lines. And they came up with a semicolon as the way of terminating lines. Which, um, you know, in earlier languages, they tried to use the period as the thing that ended a line. The idea was that a programming statement is very similar to a sentence, and we end sentences with periods, so we should end our statements with periods, except that was ambiguous with the decimal point, and so that caused problems. So we moved to semicolons. But I, I think we should go back to the idea that one statement per line. And if we do that, we can clean up the syntax even more. So this is how I hope the next language will look. That we'll just say, if a equals 0, then on the next line, we've got a thing. And I think we can make the assignment operator even a little bit smaller. So there's a brilliant little language called Rebel, which uses 
colon as an assignment operator, which I think is beautiful. So maybe we can get rid of, get something like that. So another example of, of type errors that we see in languages like Java, in the index of function, uh, it, the function needed a way of communicating, we can't find it. And so it, it should have returned something that wasn't a number because a number indicates you know, a successful thing and any other value could have indicated that it wasn't there. But the Java type system didn't allow them to do that. So they came up with the idea of having a special number which was unlikely to be a correct result and we'll use that to indicate failure. Um, and then JavaScript didn't have to do that. They could have returned undefined or something else at that point, but they didn't, they just copied Java's mistake, but they didn't need to, they could have done a better thing. So let's look at uh, types a little bit more. So suppose you want to add two int 32s together. An int 32 is an integer composed of 32 bits. What should the return type of that be? Anyone, any idea? So, uh, so there's a couple of, well, it, yeah, so there are two answers. Um, Java says it's an int 32, but the correct answer is it's an int uh, 33. That's because when you add two 32-bit integers, there's a chance that you'll get something that's a little bit bigger than the one that you started with. And in fact, the CPUs know about that. For example, on Intel CPUs, if you add two int 32s together, there is a uh, carry bit in the flag register, which contains that critical 33rd bit, which you need because when these overflow, that, that contains the information that is being lost. But the Java standard says, throw that bit away. Don't, don't pay any attention to it. In fact, there's no way that the programmer can get access to that bit. Can't. You don't need to know that. You really need to know that, but you can't. So let's look at another one. We want to multiply two int32 together. What is the result of that? What's that type? Uh, close, very close. It's an int63 because um, one of them is a signed bit, so it only counts once. But it's still a big number. If they were unsigned, it would be an int64. Uh, and again, the CPUs know about that. For example, on Intel, uh, the EDX register contains the most significant 32 bits of that multiplication, which are really important. And Java says, no, no, you, you don't get to see those. There's no indication of what was in them. So the argument about type systems is that they help defend us against errors. But in fact, the type system is actually causing errors. Errors are happening because of the type system. Yeah? Could you argue that the exception system is there to go and help with the errors, and the type system is there to help with the type, and we don't catch the errors that we don't want to see? Exceptions don't catch. Well, at least, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is what I'm on, but when I'm on my language, if you go on and have an overflow, that's an exception. Uh, it, this is not an error in JavaScript. It's not an exception. It's just wrong. In, or JavaScript does not have this error. This is an error in Java. And in C sharp, there C plus plus C, there are lots of languages that contain this mistake. This is the industry standard. This is how everything works. So I think that's bad. So I think the next language should not expose us to this failure because this is this is bad stuff. This has caused rocket ships to blow up and, and other sorts of things. Um, but this is even worse. So JavaScript fortunately didn't suffer from the first problem, but it does suffer from this one. And that is that 0.1 plus 0.2 is not equal to 0.3, which is really surprising, right? You, you would expect that this would be true, but it's not. This is the most reported bug for JavaScript, and it's not JavaScript's fault. It's the fault of IEEE 754, which is the floating point standard that Intel proposed several years ago as a result of the failed uh, 432 project. 
and it's gotten into everything now. So all of our languages, every language fails in this case, which is really a problem. So I proposed, I proposed to fix this problem. Now the, the problem is, is very easily solved in something that I call DEC64. DEC64 was inspired by work that was done by uh, Maurice Wilkes and his team uh, on the EDSAC machine, which was one of the first von Neumann machines that was built in England in the late 40s. They had a model for floating point, which implemented this formula that a number is obtained by multiplying a coefficient, which is just a big int, with an expo or 10 raised to the power of some exponent, which is another int. And they created subroutine libraries, which implemented this, and which was perfect. In, in this scheme, 0.1 plus 0.2 is exactly equal to 0.3. Um, unfortunately, we, we lost this. Um, when we tried to move floating point into hardware in the 50s, when CPUs were made out of vacuum tubes, it was decided that that 10 was just too expensive, and so they changed it to a 2, which meant that in normalizing a number, instead of having to divide it by 10, we only have to shift it one bit, which is a lot less expensive. But we haven't reconsidered that since. And Moore's Law has given us all the capability we need to make these go really fast. Um, we just should do it. So I propose that the next language should use this as its only number type. It has the advantage that in a hardware implementation, we can add small integers together in one cycle. And we can do everything else that we need to do as well. So uh, to demonstrate it, I've developed a, uh, uh, an implementation in x64 assembly language that runs on Intel processors, uh, which is out there and free. And I would recommend anybody who's considering designing another language, this is the number type that you should be using. So the coefficient is 56 bits. The, the, the whole word is 64 bits. That's why it's called 64. The exponent is 8 bits, which allows us to go uh, 127 in either direction, which is generally big enough for, for what we want to do. And uh, if the exponent is 0, it means that the upper 56 bits are an integer. So it's recommended that all integers will have an exponent of zero, so they will all add together really fast. If you have a money value, then generally they will have an exponent of minus two to indicate that the decimal point is two ahead of the end of the number. And so those uh, similar number values could be added together in one cycle. So in the software implementation, it's not nearly as fast as a hardware implementation would be but it can add two integers together in five instructions, which is four more than ideal, but those five instructions also give you defense against overflow, which I think is really valuable. It also gives you NANDs, which I think is also really valuable. So it's there if you're, yeah. Uh, when it overflows, you divide the exponent by 10 and add one to the, or, you divide the coefficient by 10 and add one to the exponent. What happens if infinity? Well, eventually you'll get to infinity. So there's a special coded exponent that indicates that. Right, I'm, I'm getting rid of some of the problems of floating point, but not all of them. That's, that's absolutely correct. So the problem with floating point is that uh, all arithmetic is potentially approximate and so in mathematics, it's not, it's precise. And so, for example, we can't represent um, irrational numbers in, in floating point. And this system is no different than any other. So that's where some languages, you know, you do a multiplication of something, something like that, maybe four, there was something like 4.9999999, whatever, if you put it on the standard format. Yeah. So it would be like So in this one, if, if you're doing stuff with, uh, if you're, you know, adding fractions of 10, it can add those exactly. You won't get any of those weird approximate errors that you get with binary floating point. <laughs> if you're getting really big, so the, the, this can contain at most 16 and a third significant digits. 
but you're guaranteed that all of the other ones are zero. So you don't have the, the phantom precision that you get in binary floating point where it looks like you're getting more exactness than you are. Uh, right, which that's the other problem with, with uh, floating point in general, that if you add a very big thing to a very little thing, the little thing can disappear and, and not add anything. For example, in JavaScript, in the current language, if you add one to something that's bigger than nine quadrillion, you get the thing that's bigger than nine quadrillion, the, the one vanishes. Um, in this one, you'll actually get nine quadrillion plus one. We, we can, we've got, because our coefficient's a little bit bigger, we can go a little bit higher, but, but yeah. Uh, so it, it doesn't start to get weird until 36 quadrillion, which is, you know, still way smaller than the national debt. So um, for most purposes, that's good enough. But we, we've known about the problems with floating point now for many, many decades and we've learned to live with them. But the specific problem with um, decimal fractions um, has not gone away. So let's look at another math problem. So zero divided by zero, what should that be? Well, the mathematicians will say this is undefined and not in the silly way that JavaScript means undefined. This is really undefined, that it is not meaningful to ever divide anything by zero. That just doesn't mean anything. So don't talk about it. Any argument that's based on division by zero is invalid. But if you're building machines, you have to expect, well, if we allow people to divide by zero, somebody's going to do it. So something needs to happen. So what should happen? One argument is the machine should catch fire because nobody should ever be doing that. And so since no one ever does it, it shouldn't matter that the machine could catch fire because that'll never happen. Except we know it will happen, so we have to do a little bit better. Here's another argument that says we should return some sentinel value, which is not a number, such as nan, or some similar kind of thing, which indicates that didn't happen. You know, this is wrong. You know, that, that, that's a reasonable thing to do. There's another theory which says we should return zero because that's a more practically useful answer. And we can justify it by saying any zero divided by anything should be zero because there's nothing there. So it's not mathematically pure argument, but uh, it's a good engineering argument. There's another argument which says, well, whenever the thing on the top of the thing on the bottom are the same, that's one, isn't it? Uh, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, not a good argument, but you know, that could be argued. Um, years ago, I used to program on a mainframe that was built by controlled data. The thing was designed by Seymour Cray, maybe the best computer designer in history. And on that machine, zero divided by zero was exactly two. So uh, why did that happen? My theory is that he didn't care. Um, you know, someone said, hey, Seymour, you, you, we, we got a two here. He said, I'm not going to fix that because that's going to put more gates in the thing. It's going to be more expensive. And I'm going to add another cycle to division. Division is the slowest thing the ALU does. I'm not going to slow it down for everybody for the case where someone's doing something they shouldn't be doing. So leave it there. And as far as I know, I'm the only person who ever noticed it. So... Um, you, know, you could argue it doesn't matter what zero divided by zero does because it just doesn't happen enough to be important. So the reason I asked that was because I want to talk about another case which is more important. What is zero times n? Anyone have a guess as to what that should be? I'm sorry? Uh, um, yeah, there's an answer that says it should be zero because should be zero, and, uh, and mathematicians would be pretty comfortable with that. But that's not what happens in modern systems. In modern systems, it depends on the value of nan. And in fact, or uh, the value of n. So if n is nan, then zero times nan is nan, which I think is a mistake, but that's how it works. So it, um, why do I think it's a mistake? Well, first off, mathematically, it looks silly. It shouldn't matter what n is. If it's 0, it should be 0, and, and that should be that. And in fact, that's what compiler writers used to think. So if you look at the old um, compilers, 
they, uh, if they saw at compile time that some value resolved to zero, then if n is a pure expression, they don't even need to generate the code for that. They can just return a constant and be done. And so not only will the code be faster, but the compilation will actually be a little bit faster, which is a really good thing. And that worked until the new uh, uh, IEEE floating point standard was introduced, which broke that. And so now all of those compile, compilers were in error and they had to go back and patch them so that they now generate that code, even though most of the time they're not going to return anything that's going to change the value of that. So everything gets slower for no compensating benefit, which I think is a bad idea. So I think the answer to that should be zero, even though most of us don't write code that looks like that. We're mostly smart enough that if at programming time, if we see that we're multiplying something by zero, we know that we don't have to do it at all. So who writes code that would benefit from this optimization? Code generators, macro processors, and partial evaluators. They write this stuff all the time. And so making that stuff go faster, making the transpilers, for example, go faster is beneficial. So I think that's how it should work. And in fact, the DEC64 system does that. And we generalize the pattern. So uh, zero divided by n, zero times n, n times zero, and zero modulo n, we don't care what n is. If n is pure, we don't compile it. We don't even look at it. Result is zero. It makes us go a little bit faster. Another thing that we did to make things easier for compilers, for compilers was the use of reserved words. So Fortran, for example, didn't have reserved words. Uh, later languages added them to make it easier. For example, the, the B language was written on a machine on a PDP-7 that had 60, had eight kilobytes of RAM. And so they had to have the whole compiler and the operating system that it ran in all had to run in 60, in, in 8K, which is really, really small. And so he made compromises in the language in order to get it to fit. And one of the compromises was having reserved words. Um, but uh, there is a problem now with reserved words that reserved words make it harder for you because if you wanted to call a variable or a parameter something, but that name's already been reserved by the language, then your program is an error and, and that's a problem. It's an even bigger problem for the people who maintain languages because they want to introduce a new word to the language, but if people in the world are, are already using that word, then you're going to be causing those programs to go into failure. And you try to avoid doing that as much as possible. That's why exceptions in modern languages are created by throw instead of raise. The original model was we're going to raise an exception, just like you might raise a point or raise an issue. But raise was already used too much in the wild. And so we needed to find another word. And we found this really unlikely word throw. Nobody was using throw for anything. And that's how we exceptions. It was really strange at the time. It doesn't look strange now because you've look, been looking at throw your whole life probably unless you're an old guy like that one. And so you might remember when exceptions might have been raised. But you know, so that's how things happen. So I propose a way of getting rid of reserved words. Um, in any function, if a word is used as a keyword or any word can be used either as a language keyword or as a name or a variable, but not both. So this is really good for programmers because if there's a feature of the language and you don't need that feature in that function, you can take that name over and use it however you, you think adds value to your function. And it's good for language designers because if you add a new feature to the language and someone is already using that name as a variable name, you're not gonna break them. They will only break if they decide they want to use that feature. So that's gonna be a rewrite in any case. Yeah. I'm sorry? I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. OK, 
Okay, um, I want to talk about one more of these things. Camel case and underbar. So what is the correct way to write a name which is composed of multiple words? And so we have two conventions and an argument. And this is another one of those clutter arguments that goes on and on. And there is no resolution because it turns out both sides are wrong. The, the correct answer is names with spaces. So um, I don't want to go back to Fortran because Fortran didn't do it correctly, but it came pretty close. We can have uh, defined names with spaces in them, and the spaces have to be in particular places in the name. And we didn't do that again for years because it was hard to compile in small memory, but we're now measuring memory capacity in gigabytes instead of kilobytes. And so uh, it, and it turns out you don't need kilobytes to do this. So I recommend that a name is composed of one or more text atoms, which is a, a bundle of digits and, and letters um, separated by spaces. We start with the initial text atom, and then we'll combine them, um, and then keep track of the longest name that made sense, something that matched a language feature or a variable name in that context. Yeah, is this going to trip over the reserve thing I just mentioned? No, it works fine with it. So uh, yeah, and then if we don't match anything, then it's just the first one. So um, there's something, you know, since I don't think we're getting as much value out of type systems as, as we've been promised, something I think that could deliver on much of that is contracts. Contracts, programming by contracts was something that was introduced in the Eiffel language, which was a brilliant idea where um, in the definition of a function, we also have a, a clause which talks about the preconditions that when this function is called, these things must be true. And it can also have a clause which talks about the post conditions that on the conclusion of this function, these things must be true. And that allows us to be much more specific than we can in typing as to what the contract is for what is required by this function and what is insured by this function. So um, something I would hope to see in the next language in the language that replaces JavaScript is more uh, designed by contract. And the last bit is distribution. I think the most important thing in the next language will be to help us deal better with distributed programming. For, since Fortran and before, all programming was about a single process, uh, sequential process that happens in one machine. And that's not what we're doing anymore. We now have stuff which is distributed over lots of machines, either over multiple cores or over the internet. And we need to have programs that work effectively in managing all of the stuff that's happening all over. And our current languages don't do that very well at all. So. Um, most of the new languages that we see are mostly new syntax on ideas that go back to Fortran. But I, I think the really important thing that we should look, be looking for in the next language is a better handle on taking care of distribution. So that brings me to the end of my time. Um, uh, uh, before we leave, I just want to remind you to be careful out there because the web is cluttered and full of errors. So. Take some of the clutter out and make it better. Thank you.